Oh, just how long is this going to take? Yes, it's all right, Commander Straker. Nearly done. Just uh, waiting for the printout. Yes, that's it. And what have we got today? Oh, okay. Well, it's UFO today. Which one could it be? Perhaps you'd like to read the episode title. Flight Path. Yes, that's right. But to where? Well, let's find out, shall we? So, oh, ominous music welcomes back to the very early days of UFO. And uh, this is another one I've, I've noticed that um, we've completed now, well, with this episode, we'll have done the first four UFOs in production. Uh, identified Computer Affair, this, and then Survival. But we open with this chap. Um, his name is... Dawson, that's his name, uh, staggering away from a UFO towards a shadow jeep under the cover of, well, it's a very blue day for night. It's a very bright night. We're about to find out who this chap is. By the way, I, I was just thinking as the opening titles went, I was whistling along to them. I know I cut them, but I was whistling along to them. Does anyone else whistle along to the tunes? I, I do find I whistle along to most of the opening titles, um, particularly this and Joe um, and 1999 to a certain extent. Space Precinct's good to whistle to as well. Please let me know in the podcast listeners Facebook group. Dawson, medical technician, Shadow HQ. I'll be on duty in an hour. Your favourite Anderson theme tunes to whistle along to, but there we go. Big shock. This guy works for Shadow, and he's also just been involved with the aliens. Oh, when I was younger, I never thought that was a particularly effective opening, but now I, I kind of uh, appreciate it more. And here's someone else we can appreciate this week. It's only our guest star, none other than Arthur Daly himself, Mr. George Cole. Earth blast off, 15 minutes precisely. Who's having a... All personnel for leave, report to control sphere immediately. A bad day with some figures. Paul Roper, report to control sphere immediately. Countdown is proceeding. And there's a couple of deleted scenes here with um, Roper's journey back to Earth. There was a bit where uh, Joan Harrington came in and spoke to him and offered to help him with his bag and he was like, no, 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 leave me alone. And then there was a bit when he got back to Earth. Oh, was that Jeremy Wilkin picking up some extra voice work there? Not sure. Um, yeah, there was a bit, uh, sort of um, lunar module shadow, almost like a customs room. Um, yeah, the scene was shot and, and just cut. And it's noticeably completely different from the uh, the sort of reception area we see later in The Cat with the Ten Lives, because in what was shot for this episode, it's a proper set, whereas in Cat with Ten Lives, it's just stick Windsor Davies in that gatehouse over there at Pinewood Studios, and we'll just pretend, you know, show the model over there, and we'll just pretend. Um, and somehow they got away with it. I think when you've got, you know, the the facilities of a full working movie studio right there. You can sort of improvise things like that. And it's always nice to be outside rather than in a studio. And um, speaking of being inside, George Cole, AKA Paul Roper, for that is his name. Well, not only does he own Straker's car by the look of things, he's uh, a bit anxious checking the time. Well, Roper, have you made your decision? The answer's no. I won't do it. You're being stupid. It's no good. I can't go through with it. Do what you want to. Temper, temper. For God's sake, look, I said I won't tell you anything. There's always care. My wife? Yes. Leave her out of it, will you? Oh, dear. Yes, so Mr. Paul Roper of Shadow uh, is, is being threatened. Specifically, his wife is being threatened. This is uh, Sonia Fox. No, yes, this is Sonia Fox, the actress playing Carol Roper. And I kind of really like um, this setup. Paul, is that you? I know it's not typical for sort of shadow, uh, married shadow operatives. Normally everything goes to custard and it does in this episode. But I kind of like that shadow is this, you know, this dark, sometimes awful world. And this woman just seems so sweet and innocent. And someone's forced his way into the home and... <coughs> he turned the lights off. Swine. Luckily, here comes... Arthur Daly to save the day. Again, it's in it's in Straker's car. I find it odd in this episode. You do see, um, I, th I think later on, Paul Foster's car is being used by someone else. It's strange. Does everyone in the future just have this kind of car? Because we don't... I think in later episodes, you do very much associate that Straker's car, that's Foster's car, 
Lake might borrow one of them in, in later episodes, but otherwise you don't see the sort of regular civilians using them. And uh, here we go. Arthur has arrived home. I'm just going to keep calling him Arthur rather than uh, Roper. Well, maybe I will, maybe I won't, I see. But uh, he's come home, the door's open. Unlocked, I should say, and he got... Uh, he was a bit aware that something was going to happen. He seems a bit confused now. He's already being threatened by naughty people, and now someone's uh, trying to do him with a shotgun. But, of course, it wasn't a naughty person, it was... Carol! Oh, what happened? Oh, that was horrible. When you came in the door, I... I thought he'd come back. So, yeah, this intruder guy, who, uh, spoiler alert, it's Dawson. It's all right. He came in. Well, no, he, he didn't even come in. He unlocked the door, put his hand round it, switched the lights off. Come on, it's all right. It's all right. But, yeah, I, I love that the Ropers uh, have this, this massive pink bedroom. She seems very sweet and innocent as Carol. And this is a, an interesting scene, and it goes back to something I mentioned uh, in Drama at Space City, whenever that was. The police or something. On the randomizer. Which, I, I, oddly enough, is the episode that was on the randomizer this week as I record this, but I'm about five weeks ahead at the moment. The Ropers sleep in separate beds. Leave the door open. Uh, as did the Zeros. Um, and it's surprising for this show, considering how, um, uh, let's say sexually active some of its characters are but we do see that later on in I think the Psycho Bombs Daniel Clark and his wife sleep in separate beds so there you go it's an odd uh, an odd running thing with this series we can't show married couples in the same bed you swine you swine you naughty man I can't talk now no tomorrow night 12 o'clock my car. I'll give you all you want then. It's got to be said that um, George Cole does not have a very uh, a very good haircut in this episode. I mean, I'm one to talk because right now a lawnmower couldn't make sense of my hair. But I also like that he's wearing, for the most part in this episode, he's wearing one of Roy Thinnis's old costumes from Doppelganger. Anyway, it's now next morning. There's a very nice house they're filming at. I'm not sure where that is. I'm sure it's been well documented, but... Uh... <sighs> Carol is having tea in bed. Carol? It's quarter to nine. Get up, woman. Ooh, that pill suddenly did the trick. Yes. Listen, you mustn't worry about last night. It's all right now. Ah, and he's going to drop a load of total lies in her lap. But it makes her happy, so... You phoned the police? Yes. They came round. You were asleep. And they said I, I was a very good man, and um, they came in their magic police helicopter. Picked him up a couple of miles along the road. What did he want? Oh, just an intruder. Apparently they've been after him for some time. Will I have to make a statement? I don't know. All's well that ends well. In the land of make-believe that um, um, Paul Roper is, is concocting for Carol. Yeah, maybe I will just call him Roper rather than Arthur. It's always anyone seems to talk about when they, they see this episode. It's like, whoa, Arthur Daly in UFO. And it's like, well, George Cole had a very long career Drink your tea. before Minder and after Minder. Here we go. It, it's taken a, a, quite a long time, actually, for us to get round to, to Shadow or any of our recognisable characters. I do love a bit of... Uh, funky shadow headquarters music. Ah, the music changed on me there, but I was ready for it. And here's uh, Dr. Schroeder with... What is that? That's a clock in a block of glass or something. 807 Roper for debriefing tests, Doctor. Ah, so it's time for some tests on Mr. Roper. And who else is in the room... Oh, Shadow Technician Dawson. Naughty man Dawson. I assume you're familiar with this test. It measures how much strain goes into any decision you make. Yeah. It's amazing how hard we work even on the simplest decisions. Like whether or not to have a cup of coffee. Well, you know, this is Shadow, so everyone... That doesn't apply to anyone in Shadow, because do you want a cup of coffee is always met with... Oh, yes. Three, please. But this test that Roper's about to undergo, I know it's meant to look futuristic. Start the test. But I don't understand what any of it is about. 
and I think that is kind of a problem. It would not, you know, it, it, looking futuristic is one thing, even though it looks a bit dated now. But it would nice. It would be nice to be a bit relatable. So that what was that? A picture of a shed. He got that right. A picture of a city. He got that right. A picture of. I can't even tell what that is, but he got it wrong. Oh dear. He's sweating now. It's very stressful. Dawson's watching. There's a picture of the ground from the sky. He got that right. More ground. Got that wrong. More ground. He got that right. And he got that right, whatever it was. That looks like a boat. Got that right. Good man. Oh, there's um, a, a, a herd of some animals grazing by the water. He got that one wrong. What else? Come on. I'm doing good at this. Uh, that's the ground again. You got that right. More ground. Got that right. There's another city. You got that right. There's the inside of a factory. You got that right. Uh, no, that's wrong now. Uh, there's another city. You got that right. There was a picture from a book. You got that wrong. There's this, the ground again. You got that right. There's another page from a book. You got that wrong. Another page from a book. You got that wrong. And uh, I don't even know what that is. There's a map. You got that wrong. There's a city. You got that right. There's another city. Oh. Well, I can see why he was having problems with that. That test is completely incomprehensible. Oh, so all. Just the man I was looking for. For me. To ask you to... What have I done? Something on your mind? Oh, nothing, though. No. It's these kids' games. The debriefing test? Yeah. Well, they're not just for amusement. Let's right, forget it, shall we? I've got her in Carol. I'm taking her out this evening. Sure. How is she? She's fine. Ooh. Fine. And it's strange, isn't it? Um, I'm sure I'm not the only person who feels like this. We have a, a guest character this week named Paul. And of course, Paul Foster would become such an important character on the show just one week later. I don't know why they kept this character's name as Paul then. So how did Roper make out in the decision stress? It was too early to say for certain, but he seemed, well, he seemed a bit strung out. You couldn't tell the difference between a herd of cattle and a picture of the Taj Mahal. Any ideas? I'm very concerned. Could be anything. Boredom. Mrs. His wife. <laughs> See you. Well. That's uh, expert uh, psychiatric analysis there from Dr. Schroeder. Now, if Jackson had done it, oh, Jackson would have done it properly. I don't think I can take you out looking like that. What do you mean? Oh, people might say, what's that beautiful young girl doing out with a broken down old wreck? <laughs> well, don't worry. I can always tell them I married you for your money. Yeah, the age difference between the two of them is quite noticeable. I mean, I say that not knowing how old George Cole would have been at this point. Jeff, I'm hungry. But I'm assuming there's at least 10, 15 years between them. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just strange that the show would go out of its way to acknowledge it. What do they say? Not good. The stress decision tests are positive. Oh, no. But he was scoring positive all the way through, and that seemed like a good thing. Decision making below par. Reflexes bad. Animal identification weak. He's an out and out risk, Alec. And we can't afford to take chances. I've Again, this discussion makes the whole test thing seem so weird in the way it's presented. I don't know why. There were literally photos of maps and photos of, like, photographs of pages in a book. Lovely evening, Doc. It doesn't mean anything, that test, and they're like, oh my goodness, this is very serious. But it, I don't know, I wish I could understand that test a bit, just a bit more. Hey, I'm not Cinderella, you know. Don't drive so fast. I don't have to be home by midnight. Oh, but he does. Sorry. Makes you wonder why... Oh, no, I was going to say makes you wonder why he agreed to take her out this night when he knows he's got a call. But he did it because he's a good guy who wants to uh, cheer his wife up after that terrifying intruder incident. Uh-oh. I thought I saw someone. And she did. There was someone in the bushes over there. It's nothing. We're Again, it's another beautifully bright... Come on. Um, midnight. Yes, now, uh, forgive me for going a bit Lloyd Grossman, but who lives in a house like this? It's a very nice house. I mean, considering we see later on Paul Foster lives in a pokey little apartment, Straker's house is nice, but it's not big. What's Roper doing to earn so much money to have such a nice house? All right. With a beautiful wife. We may ask ourselves, well... How did he get here? Come on. Ah, he's also wearing a pink shirt now. Now he's doing the whole, there are no monsters in the house. Everything's fine. I'll put the car away. Better take that dress off, because the pinkness of it, you'll fade into the pink walls and the pink door and the pink everything. Too much pink. 
I've not seen that much pink since uh, young Estes in The Witness was in the pinkest hotel, not hotel room, hospital room, back in Space Precinct, oh dear. So, I love that the clock over the garage is also clearly showing midnight, yet there's bright blue sky visible in the trees beyond. It's all right. I know it's it's a common thing in, in shows and films of this era. Who's this sneaking around in the bushes? Begin. 42 degrees, <gasps> 2 minutes, Ooh. angle 8. Four. He's passing on information to the naughty man on the phone. Angle 65. Go down to 68 degrees. So, of course, the man in the bushes is not Dawson, because Dawson is on the other end of the phone. So who does that leave? Holding a tape recorder and a microphone, it's... Three. Wearing his best shocked face, it's Alec Freeman. And the, another, this is brilliant as an interrogation. You put Roper in a room. Um, again, it looks like Schroeder's office where they did the medical test earlier. Wheel in a television with Straker on it. Don't get Straker in the room, because that would involve Straker getting up from behind his desk. We can't have that. Uh, it's just be, the idea of Straker being on a TV and telling him off. Oh, dear. Well, that didn't work, Alec. Got to make him talk, Alec. Uh, maybe if I went in there? No, no, he'd be expecting that. Money? No. Blackmail? Or threats? Violence? His wife, maybe. Mm, she's pretty violent. Tell me about her. Carol? She's young, attractive. He likes the colour pink. I can understand it if she Understand it. Can't you accept the fact that, that he's a traitor? I know that. But it's also a matter of degree. Degree, nothing. It's what he's told him that matters, not why. And scenes like this I find I find interesting with early UFO, where we'll see, the setup for the dilemma is, I mean, to be honest, it's fairly weak. And George Sewell, and particularly Ed Bishop, are really giving it, my God, this is so important. It, it couldn't be more important. Also here, he, you don't Straker comes across as quite threatening. And you think by keeping quiet, you'll be able to protect her? Not when I get through with her, you won't. Oh, he's shaking his head. You tell us what we want to know. That's the best way to give her protection. Aha, now they've called him into Straker's office. Please. Things are getting serious. Yeah, this costume of, of Roy Thinnis's... Two, seven, Again, I think we've seen it on the randomizer before. It was on John Croxley in ESP. They got some use out of it. I have a feeling George Sewell might even have worn it at one point. Numbers. Angles. What do they mean, Robert? I was given program numbers for SID. Told to feed in certain information. Memorize the results. Oh. Strange to hear SID being spelled out as SID. I'll give you the data, not the significance. You mean to tell me you didn't know what you were doing when you handed over those figures? No. We're going to have to put everything into finding out. Get me Commander Straker. Yes, Lieutenant. This is where I, I feel... Well, keep working on it, Lieutenant. We may be starting to lose the story in the editing department. Direction indicators. Now, what does that mean? Particularly with the moon base scenes. Of course, only in three dimensions. I, I've seen it mentioned before. Yeah. That parts of this episode feel like they're edited together in the wrong order, and I completely... Not much, but... I wouldn't say agree with it, but I can see why people would say that. With these these moon base scenes... Flight path. But to where? So we've now established Roper's information was a flight path. Okay. See what we've got. Or some sort of a flight path. And the fact that they chose Roper to do their dirty work. But then, I, I'm, it, it feels like we have that scene where they say... Oh, it's a flight path. Okay, but I feel like later on there's another scene where they, they go, My God, what do these numbers mean? Oh, it's a flight path. We'd better tell Straker. And then it cuts back to Straker going, My goodness, what could those numbers mean? On the other end of that phone. I, I mean, let me know if, if I, I'm alone in this. As I said, I, I know I'm not. Other people have, have mentioned let him go, Alec. that the editing in this episode feels a bit strange. In terms of how... In, just in terms of the order of certain scenes. Very neat. You've just let the whole base know we're going to release Roper in an hour. <laughs> How does that work? Yeah, Straker just issued an instruction to Ford 
who's in the other in the control room. He's put his key down and held the key down so that uh, everyone would hear that Roper is going to be let out. But why does that mean the whole base is going to know? Is Ford that much of a gossip? Like I, cu I couldn't believe that of him. Let him go, Alec. We must draw them out into the open. Okay. And if it means putting his life at risk, I'm all for it. Now one moment, Moonbase. That's actually not. <laughs> that's actually not as. Um, um, mocking as I thought it would be when I said it, because that's kind of Straker's attitude. And what does she make of them? They describe relative planetary positions. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. The relative position of the sun, moon, and earth would fit Roper's figures. One snag. The last set of information is a time reference, but it still doesn't make sense. Well, you've come up with enough to scare the daylights out of me, Lieutenant. Keep working on that last sequence. Out. So we already knew it was a flight path, and it sounded like it was they knew everything and now oh now we're finding out more than we didn't know before i don't know it it just feels the editing here feels kind of strange and now we get this long scene of straker alone in his office with a, a slide rule and a pencil he's been very busy trying to calculate something but they've got the flight path they've got the idea that it's the sun moon and earth I don't know what's going on with some of these scenes, the way they are ordered. It just feels odd. Sir, you wanted to know when Rover left. Did I? I don't remember reading that in the script. But my orders were that he was to be released in one hour's time. Yes, sir, but I understand Colonel Freeman. I see. God, Alec. All my problems are caused by Alec Freeman. Yeah, um... Maximum security uh, alert. Why... Get me Captain Carlin on Skydiver. What? I don't know. Attention. I know Straker did say, let him go in one hour, but, um, yeah, oh, I don't know. This is cool, though. I love this action montage of stock footage, and considering this is only the third episode in production order, we have quite a bit of stock footage already hanging around. We've got some interceptors to launch. Of course, Straker's going to tell them what to do. Faced with a probable UFO attack against an under Yeah, there's the observatory from... Now, that observatory turned up in close-up, but is that reused footage from the Secret Service, or is that just part of a reused prop? Um, that control room with the massive um, satellite dish on the front. Who knows? Anyway, interceptors, are go. Mobiles, are go. Observatories, possibly from other series, are go. And there's... Skydiver diving and again you, you can just tell by looking at the picture that it's stock footage but I don't think we've seen that shot in the show yet for real until now Alert operational sir Captain Carlin standing by right Captain Carlin Straker Carlin reading you I want you to launch Sky 1 for possible interception area green 0B make a 20 mile radius sweep around Shadow HQ sounds pretty close to home sir what's going on that's our problem Captain you just concentrate on being ready out Launch stations. Yes, sir. Launch stations! Poor Skydiver crew. They never know what's going on. Two. Two, yeah. And I do feel for, for Jeremy Wilkin and Georgina Moon and uh, John Kelly having to make the most of such little screen time in moments like this. Like, Jeremy Wilkin had a clipboard and, my goodness, nobody wrote on a clipboard more, more seriously and g genuinely than he did there. Um, yeah, these are good people and they just get barely a look in sometimes. Anyway, Sky One is away. And so is the UFO. I don't know. Were they listening in on shadow frequencies? Oh no, they've come to get Roper. And this is um, one of my favourite special effects bits from the whole show, I think. Again, another very bright blue sky night. <laughs> have relocated UFO in area 427 Blue. You can maybe get away with, with unconvincing day for night once. They've done it three times this week. And yet in the model shots, obviously, it's it's graded just right. Giving you. Suspect driving east on route four in bronze shadow car. Follow and observe. Roger, out. Oh, so it's a specific shadow car. That brand of car is not available to the general public? Interesting. Oh, I love that shot, that model shot of the UFO passing so close over Roper's car. And now he's he's making a run for it, but the UFO's after him. 
and a very nice integration of model and live action shot there as we see um, Roper's viewpoint as the UFO hits the ground in front of him. And there we go. He's crashed into a petrol station. And needless to say, you know, this is an Anderson show. The petrol station explodes with the might of... I don't know. All the explosions in Thunderbirds combined. The whole place is totally on fire. Anyone who was in there is dead, dead, dead. Control. I'm positioned over target. But Roper survived. All destroyed. And an odd, a rare, very rare moment of bad acting from Ed Bishop here. That hand, when he, when he does a face palm and shakes his head. Coordinates. Roger, it looks terrible. <laughs> I almost thought that looks absolutely terrible. Um, but hey ho, yes, Roper survived. Thank goodness. With only light scratches. Oh, that's it. The universe is minus one UFO. Oh, is that little Diddy Shadow Ambulance that I believe still exists? They bring them in now, sir. I'm sure I've seen it at Andicon or, or similar. It might have been um, a, a Fab Worlds or another convention or something. All right, Paul. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, I'm glad we had this talk. Now, let him continue to bleed internally in another room. Maintain surveillance for Shadow Medic Dawson. Yeah, there's two security guards in uh, This is a war, Alec. What I believe was later Lake's car. Risk. I don't buy that, and I never will. It's too complicated for people like me, and too simple for people like you. And that's this is a, a scene that I find is a good example of what I feel doesn't work with early UFO. They're so keen to present serious issues where people can be, you know, at loggerheads sort of oh no, you're wrong, oh, I'm right. But they they don't quite take the time to really uh, develop uh, a situation where moments like that, interactions like that, would arise naturally. In later episodes, they do, but in early episodes, I think the Andersons are so keen to to present character conflict that they don't quite did it on purpose. Um, set it up that cost him his life. effectively. It could cost him his wife. Ah, we've learnt some rhyming words. A couple of guards to Roper's house. Wife rhymes with life. So, at the Roper home, Carol is fretting, presumably because Paul isn't back yet. Oh yeah, it's 25 past midnight. She's fretting in the bedroom, because I guess they don't have a front room. She keeps all her magazines in the bedroom. We've just passed the Rapton flyover. Yes, these two security guards. One of them is played by David Dacre, who Doctor Who fans will um, remember from uh, Nightmare of Eden and the Time Warrior. He was, he was Iron Gron in the Time Warrior. Very good, very hammy performance in that. Um, it doesn't get much to do here. He's just a very minor shadow security man. Oh. And Carol, with her incredible hearing, has heard the front door handle creak slowly open. Oh, she's very nervous because she's Carol Roper and she doesn't like to leave her pink bedroom. <laughs> I may sound like I don't like the character. I do. She's kind of a wimp. But I, I really like uh, Sonia Fox, actually. And I haven't seen her in much outside of the ITC shows. She would turn up in things occasionally, like like this and Danger Man and so forth. But, yeah, she's very good at um, at playing the, uh, the very timid housewife here. She's got the shotgun out again. Oh! And the shot went straight through the door. Caught Dawson, oh, in the cheek. That's a fairly, fairly messy. I mean, it's it is mostly blood. You don't see an injury as such, but and this is where I have to say, Carol really does not help herself here. Dawson is down, severely injured, and he's crawling ever so slowly towards his gun. She has so much time to get it off him, but because she's such a wimp, she doesn't. She dead. Well, that's that then. Another. Shadow Operative's marriage ends in death. Straker's still fiddling with the Data whiteboard. from flight plan passed to aliens by Roper uh -huh. have been analysed. Input information incorrect. Uh -huh. Result negative. We're still on this, are we? What do you make of it, Joan? Nothing. Straker's not going to buy that. Rerun it. It won't alter the result, Lieutenant. Will if you permutate it differently. Oh. 
And if you insist, Lieutenant. You ask a different question, you'll get a different answer. Again, this is what I mean by scenes being in the wrong order. We have that scene there where it suddenly seems like nobody knows what's going on with these figures. And now we're back in Straker's office. He's just standing in front of that um, wonderful mini... Um, I don't know what you'd call it. Um, solar system thing in the, the wall of his office. It looks very nice. It's a very cool shot. But it just suddenly seems like... Uh, Everyone's forgotten what they already knew regarding flight plans and so forth. And now it's still in Straker's office, but it must be some time later. Dawson died ten minutes ago. Oh, no. Yes. Shotgun makes quite a mess. The doctors found this. Oh, I've been looking for that. It's some sort of electronic probe. It had been inserted into his temple. Well, I think the picture is almost complete. Who am I kidding? No, it's not. I don't have a clue what's going on this week. Come over here, Alec. Watch this. Oh. Yes, we're making... I don't know if this this prop thing, this prop solar system uh, observatory... No, not observatory. But there's, a, there's an obvious word for what this is. And I can't think of it at the moment. But was this installed in Straker's office just for this one story? There. Ah. Sunrise on the moon. Exactly. Mm. That's how they plan to make the attack. The point where the Earth is directly between the Sun and the Moon. At sunrise, keeping between Moon Base and the Sun. Visually undetectable. But it would be picked up by Moon Base radar the moment it crossed the horizon. Not if the attack were planned to coincide with heavy sunspot activity. Ooh. Like that predicted in two days' time. Sunspots. Yes, they were an occasional fawn in the side of the Moon Base personnel. I think Mindbender used that as well. We have Roper's flight plan too, remember? I don't see how we can stop it. One man, on his own, in a predetermined position out on the moon's surface. A rocket launcher, polarized visor. It'd be suicide. But you can't expect a man to... I don't need a volunteer, Alec. I've chosen you. Oh, Roper, yeah. Suppose you used this to twist his arm. No, oh, I didn't have to. Photo of Carol's dead body. To try and even the score. Then when are you going to tell him? Maybe you'll never need to know. Hmm. Oh, dear. Poor old Carol. Well, she had two. She had the shotgun and Dawson's gun that she could have grabbed. I just, I, I watch that scene and think, come on, woman, do something, do something, anything, hide in the other room. Now, once you're outside, maintain radio silence. One favor. I couldn't tell Carol, my wife. If you could book an Earth call, either way, you know what I mean. I'll sort things out. When you get back. Oh. I like the, the moon base girls trying to be reassuring here. And speaking of reassurance, Good. here's Straker. Each one. Oh, Roper. Good luck. I like the way Ed Bishop plays that as just, oh, wishing the guy good luck. This is a very minor part of this. As long as he does the job, I don't really care about the man. Yeah, for exit procedure. And this is where one of those deleted scenes that I mentioned at the very beginning of all this actually comes into play again where um, it's Joan who's helping him out to the airlock with all his gear because earlier on she'd come to collect him for the flight home and he'd snapped at her. Antonio Ellis is playing this now as kind of a no hard feelings sort of thing. Good luck Paul. And if you don't come back I guess we'll have to find another Paul. Better, younger, stronger, more handsome, hairier. <laughs> This is starting to appeal to me more and more. And this is it. We, yeah, we've come to this point now where we, we have George Cole in a spacesuit. We have Arthur Daly in a spacesuit. It's... I know I said I wouldn't mention Minder again, but it is quite the image. Open out of doors. Stand by for exit. And so that's it. Roper is out on the surface, on his own, armed only with a bazooka. Now... Where's that UFO? Is there any chance of the radar trackers operating? Not with all this sunspot activity. Now, when I was um, younger, uh, many years ago, uh, I had a tape th with this episode on. Because I, I, the first time I'd seen this was when it went out on the BBC. But then a few years later, a company named Digital Entertainment, uh, who also later released the uh, in complete run of uh, Space Precinct on... DVD and VHS. First time that had uh, ever been released in its entirety. I think that was the first Anderson DVD ever, actually, the uh, Space Precinct DVDs. But they put out 
all of UFO on VHS, including the episodes that had uh, had been missed for the compilation. And uh, so I had the first set, the first tape, I should say, in this collection was, of course, Volume Zero, which made it very hard to track down in the pre-Amazon days. Volume Zero. But they had the first three episodes of the series on there. Uh, this identified and uh, confetti check. No, not confetti check. Con this identified and computer affair. And it was so obvious to me that the show needs something. Something more. We've got the beginnings of something great here. And there's just a key element missing that it, it's not quite coming together yet. We need... I don't know, just someone with a bit of spark, someone with a bit of, you know, a, a slight maverick air to them, someone who can do the physical stuff. Uh, and, and generally, also, the show kind of needs to kick up the backside in terms of pacing in these really early episodes. So it's just so great to go from that first tape into the second tape, volume one, with uh, Exposed and Survival on. And, and seconds since sun up, Lieutenant. Paul Foster's arrival is just... That, that kick that it needed. Um, so with these these three early episodes, I, I, I to be honest, I don't get a huge amount out of them. I can appreciate and enjoy moments um, in all three. I can kind of appreciate what they were trying to do more than what they actually did. Like with the downbeat stuff in this episode, um... The stuff in the forest in Computer Affair. Not much from Identified, to be honest. But I, I just, I don't know, how do other people feel about the, the, the first three UFO episodes in production order? Identified, Computer Affair, and uh, Flight Path. I know that on broadcast they were, they were never shown in three consecutive uh, episodes like that, I think. Ooh, he hit the UFO. Yeah, I think this was shown as, like, somewhere in the middle of the run. Where, again, it doesn't quite work because the costumes, the the wigs, it, it, it feels like a very early episode. But hey-ho. So, this is great where we have a guy out on the surface just kind of pottering around in total silence for a while. I can go quiet for as long as I like until I have something to talk about. Roper and his bazooka, he's gonna bazooka that UFO. When it reappears from behind that rock. The UFO's hiding at the moment. It's being all shy, but he's lining up his... Oh, there it is! The UFO's almost playing peekaboo with him. I love that. It, the, the top of the UFO just very slowly peeks out from behind that rock. And then... Hey! That's a direct hit, and... a lovely crash landing. I love that it's sort of spewing very pink fire. Yes, probably full of some harmful gas that wouldn't be used today. But he's done it. Good old Roper. UFO destroyed. He's done it. Get a moon hopper out there fast. Oh, right, we're done. Ah, but remember, this is a one-episode character. Losing a little air. And this is UFO. Damage. Only slight. So we have to go for our downbeat ending. He's got a slight puncture in his suit. We don't even see what causes it. He's got his puncture repair kit, which is a little tube of glue. Oh, he's dropped it. Oh, dear. He can shoot down a UFO, but he can't handle a tube of glue. He's going to make himself comfier here. Try again with the glue. His visor's clouding up. And I do like, actually, with this, this glue thing. Every time he applies some glue air bubbles appear in it because the glue just isn't setting right oh because we we seem to be skimping on our emergency survival gear in shadow again it's money going into those coffee machines listen a moon hopper is on its way it'll be with you in minutes fine see there it is. And there was a model shot earlier where... Oh, I like that Roper's visor clouds up more and more. There was a model shot earlier that showed Moonbase actually wasn't that far from Roper's position. I hope this evens things up. 
Obviously, it, it isn't because he he went out on foot. Carol, Carol, Carol. Oh dear! I'm hold on the bubble. Paul. This expanding bubble of glue. Roper. He's almost out, and he's gone. And there goes the glue bubble. And oh yeah, we just hear the moonmobile arriving. Just too late to do anything. Probably. There's a chance he survived after that. Um, but he's never mentioned again because, as I said, next week we get a new Paul, a better Paul. Uh, an all-round more interesting Paul for more interesting stories. So that was Flight Path. And um, I, you know, I when I had that old Volume Zero tape, I used to find this the weakest episode of the first three. Now I would say that definitely goes to Identified. I do appreciate this one more than I used to. But it's still not anywhere near the heights that this show would would very soon be be aspiring to. And I think they are trying. It's just not quite... Something's missing. And it's a big old hairy guy named Paul Foster. But some nice stuff here with um, with George Cole and uh, and Sonia Fox. Uh, but the, the editing stuff in this, the story just doesn't quite click the way it uh, perhaps should have done. Sorry. 